Women Taking the Lead, Episode 51. Love isn't always what you think it's going to be. It doesn't always have to manifest itself the way you think it's going to. And I had mistakenly assumed that as a, you know, as a minister, as a clergy person, that what she was going to need was clergy person stuff. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn, and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. This episode is sponsored by Luma Coaching. Want some support to get your dreams off the ground? Go to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Kate Braestrup, who serves as a chaplain to the main game warden service. She is the author of a novel, Onion, and several best-selling memoirs. She has written for O, the Oprah Magazine, the New York Times, Moore Magazine, and the Huffington Post. She lives in Maine with her husband, Simon Vanderven, and their six children. Okay, Kate, that's only a little intro for everyone. So tell us more about you and your humble beginnings. Well, I do serve as the chaplain for the main warden service, and that's game wardens, not prison wardens, <laughs> um, which is important. And I have been doing that since 2001. And the I, I became a chaplain um, really because my first husband, Trooper Drew Griffith of the Maine State Police, was killed in the line of duty in 1996. And that was such a um, profound and shattering experience that um, it really demanded that I do something different. And up until then, I had been pretty much staying home with my children. We had four small children. And taking care of them and doing some writing uh, on the side, not very successfully. Um, <laughs> and after he died, uh, we, all of us, I think, but as, but me as the remaining adult in the family really felt like something, you know, something was different, something I had to do something with the experience, not so much of losing him, but of being as profoundly supported and loved as we were um, by our community, by the extended law enforcement community of Maine, um, and by God. So I started seminary in 1998 and uh, have been serving, as I say, since 2001 in the field with game wardens who respond to a variety of wildland calamities in addition to enforcing fish and wildlife law. So they're the ones who search for people who've gotten lost in the woods or um, respond when somebody has a boating accident or a snowmobile accident. Um, they have uh, the dive team that um, retrieves the body if someone drowns in our lakes or rivers. So those are the sorts of things that I go to with them. And with the idea that I am there as support for people, family members who are going through something that has some resonance with what I went through. So it's really about giving, giving away what I was given. Wow. What, what a, what an opportunity to have received such love and support mm. from your community and to be inspired then to go out and do the same for other people. Yeah. And, and actually I would say that my uh, my experience so far in whatever that is, 14 years, uh, is that it's actually more common than not that people who have been through a profound loss, like the loss of a parent or a spouse or a child, will find something to do with it. They will find some creative, in the broadest sense, creative um way to allow it to change their lives in a positive way. But that's actually a, a human instinct, I think. So it wasn't unusual, really, in retrospect, that I that, that moment of losing Drew was the moment that turned my life in a different direction and that that direction was about, you know, was positive. 
that that's normal for us. Yeah, I completely agree. We are creative beings. Mm -hmm. And so whatever is going on inside of us, we feel an urge to manifest it mm -hmm. in the outside world, whether we're conscious of it or not. And that's why they say, you know, if you are, you know, kind of going crazy internally and, you know, you're disorganized, well, your outside world will become a reflection of your inside yeah. world, right? That's the, that is still the creative instinct to, you know, reflect outwards what we're experiencing inwards. But when it's been such a powerful and positive experience, then what, what we create is something so much more profound. Um, and that we get satisfaction from yeah. um, and can ripple out. Yeah. So that's so great. Well, Kate, you've definitely had success in your life. Your books have done well. The work that you're doing, I know you're commended for. And you've definitely gained some confidence. But take us back to a time when you were playing small and you may not have been aware of it at the time. Share with us the story and the lessons you learned. Well, I think the, I mean, playing small is, I'm using an example that's actually, um, it's pretty difficult to do anything other than play small. That immediately after I was told that my husband was dead, um, that is a profoundly disempowering experience it, on every level. And it, it because your world has been shattered and everyone around you is um, appears to have more control certainly more information, more ability to affect what happens next, uh, more knowledge of what's supposed to happen next than you do. If, um, if you've been bereaved, particularly suddenly and particularly if you're not in a place that you have a sense of being able to manage. So if you're not in your house or you're not um, in a hospital where you've been at the hospital long enough to kind of know even where the bathroom is, right? I mean, we're talking about that level of being out of control. And I was in that moment. And um, I, you are very much at the mercy of whoever is around you who does have experience and knowledge and information. And so there were certain features of that experience that fortunately I was surrounded by people who loved me and who wanted me to be okay and who were determined to take care of me. But one of the um, one of the instincts that I had very strongly was that I wanted to see Drew's body. Um, I wanted to go see him, and I know now from my work that that is extremely common. That almost all of us have this powerful urge to go and take care of our loved one's body because that's how we take care of each other. We take care of each other's bodies, and um, I wasn't allowed to do it. That I asked, and I they said, no, you can't do that. And I think I asked again a couple of times, no, you can't do that. Knowing what I know now, I would be able to say, yes, actually I can do that. And, um, you must allow me to do that. One of the, uh, as elements that I bring into my work is the attempt to make sure that the bereaved know the power they do have that not only are they capable of doing this, are they capable of making that decision for themselves, um, but that there's nothing strange or wrong about it, that it's actually very natural and normal to want to do that, and that they can make that, I can help them make that happen. Um, so that's, um, you know, it, it it's normal to not know what to do when someone you love has died, because most of us don't do that a lot, if we're lucky. Um, <laughs> and so I... It, I'm not sure I'd call it playing small. <laughs> call, I think I'd call it being small. Uh, but um, it certainly was a, it turned out to be a very useful experience in terms of helping other people who are in that place because I know how to bring them out and help them to enlarge themselves to meet this challenge. Yes, I, I agree. I think it, it is a very normal and to some extent healthy re reaction that when yes. we go through a trauma like that to go inward, mm -hmm. right? And and you spoke about like to the point where like in your own home, you had trouble finding the bathroom, right? That, yeah. that was, you know, you were completely disengaged from what was going on around you and your physical space. But 
what was going on inside of you needed so much of your energy. Right, exactly. And attention. Yeah, it's it, it completely makes sense. And you're absolutely right. It's such a blessing if you're going through moments like that to have people around you who are caring for you, have your best interests at heart and can guide you through the next right. steps. Because even though we're, you know, experiencing this trauma, there's still things that need our attention and that we want to give our attention so that we can honor, especially in your circumstance, to be able to honor your husband. Right, exactly. Yeah. And how do you do that in this? You know, what is literally, what do you do? Uh, most of us don't know because we haven't done it before. Uh, and we may not even know anyone who's done it before because fortunately in our day and age, you know, a premature death is unusual. Right. Um, so it, it's not something we'll, we're likely to have heard about from other people. Or um, So the important part about that, too, is realizing that then as a chaplain who responds to a scene, it's very important that I have authority. And that's something that um, chaplains, uh, emergency service chaplains of any description need, need to really take on. And it's something that women especially can have a hard time with because the nurturing dimension of it is, you know, comes more naturally and feels more like what we're supposed to be doing. But there are times when you really need to have the authority to say, no, this is what we're going to do next. Because the bereaved don't have any, they have nothing. They're so powerless that they need in order, you, they need you to be an advocate and you to be a, um, in a sense, an authority figure, a person who, who does know what's happening and does know what to do next. And that can be tough because you are always dealing with uncertainties and every situation is different and every family is different and every loss is different. And so you have to really be willing to sort of step up and say, um, if we're going to, you know, if we're going to make a Hail Mary pass, I'm choosing the direction because I know something. Um, and that's, a, you know, that I, I find that is an interesting little transition for female clergy in general, but female chaplains to make is realizing that they have to be able to say, this is what we're going to do. Yes. Yes. And what was your experience, Kate? Because I find with women, sometimes we are better able to advocate and step up for other people than we are for ourselves. Did you find it was much easier when you were in the role of chaplain taking care of the bereaved um, than you would say if you were advocating for yourself? Yeah. I, well, and I think, you know, even having um, when my husband died, it, you know, the fact that I had to advocate for my children was different. If I hadn't had children, it would have been a very different um, set of, you know, I did have to figure out how am I going to do this? How do I explain this to them? Um, it forced me to think about sort of what had happened and um, my explanation for what had happened on that level, on a nine-year-old's level. When they said, why did dad die? I would have to, I had to come up with an explanation. So there's something to be said for having people depend on you and to sort of step up to protect them or to advocate for them. Even if you, if you were left to yourself, you might not necessarily do it or feel as strongly about it. It's good to arouse the mother bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was just thinking it gives you that opportunity also to see what you're capable of. Yeah. Right. Because you are more willing to push the limits, to go a little bit further, ask for more or even demand more. Yeah. You know, and then you you can look back in retrospect and go, oh, OK, well, the next time this comes up, even if it's right. just me, I know what the limits right. are. I could do that. Yeah. 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 And I will say. I will defend you know, I'll defend the game wardens too, if, um, or I'll feel like defending them if I feel like someone's being rude to them, which happens all the time to law enforcement officers. But anyway, if I feel like someone's being rude to them, I will feel the hackles on the back of my neck go up as if they were one of my children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I have to say, Kate, it's okay. I can, I can do this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm large, I'm armed, you know, I'm really, <laughs> you know, I'm okay. 
<laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, it's true. It doesn't matter how big or armed they are. You still feel yourself being like, yes. I will defend you. Yes. This is not right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, Kate. Now share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake up call. Take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. Um, well, we learn a lot from failure. I find I learn a lot from failure, which is a good thing because I have been known to fail. But when I first started as the chaplain, one of the first calls, um, incidents I was called to was a, a child had died um, in a lake. And um, I was driving down, you know, everything in Maine is two hours away from me. So I was driving to the lake to be there with the family. And it was really the first time I'd been called to do this. So on the way down, um, I spent sort of the first hour of the trip fretting about what this family was going through, worrying about them, um, thinking about what would happen if this was my child. And if you have a lot of children, which I do, there's always a kid who's the age of whoever the, the child is that's died. So it was very easy to put myself into the position of the mother. And um, so after about an hour of this, I was in tears driving along down 95, which is not really the most useful thing for a chaplain to be doing. So I realized I'm not going to be much help if I show up at the scene, you know, um, blubbering. So to pull myself together, I, I thought about all of the useful, you know, clever things that I had learned in seminary about the meaning of death and why bad things happen to good people and all that stuff. I had this big fat file from seminary. Biblical references, you know, what did the Pope say about it? What did Mother Teresa say about it? Lots and lots of stuff. So that was very comforting. I get to the scene. And of course, um, the first problem was that I had pictured the mother of this child sitting down and prepared to be lectured about what the Pope and Mother Teresa had to say about grief and loss. <laughs> I mean, I look back and it's so stupid. Um, in other words, I'd pictured giving a sermon to this woman. And needless to say, that's not what she needed from me at all. And it took, I mean, thank God she ignored me because I think I probably wouldn't have been very helpful. Um, it took what felt like hours, but it was probably five minutes for me to recognize, oh, none of the things I've been preparing to do are, need to be done at all. None of it's useful. It's all gone. And to start paying attention to what she actually needed. And what she actually needed was someone to pick up her son at the airport, her other, another child flying in, um, a, a ride to the hospital because her husband had been injured in the same accident that had killed her daughter. And, um, uh, oh, and somebody to meet her, a third child who was coming, driving in by car and didn't know that this had happened yet. So she had three very practical, difficult tasks that she needed performed. And that I could help her with. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very good lesson in, not just for a chaplain, but really for anybody, that uh, love isn't always what you think it's going to be. It doesn't always have to manifest itself the way you think it's going to. And I had mistaken, mistakenly assumed that as a, you know, as a minister, as a clergy person, that what she was going to need was clergy person stuff like, um, sermons and prayers and, you know, lectures on theology. <laughs> um, and what in fact she needed was, uh, you know, she needed help getting her family together and getting to the next place. And, um, when we did that, we had loved her. When we took care of that, we had given her love in the way that she needed it from us. So it was a very good lesson in, I mean, now at this point, I don't even bother to try to plan when I'm on my way to something because I figure God will tell me what to do or the Lieutenant will tell me what to do when I get there. Um, and the bereaved will bring forth from me what they need from me. Oh, Kate, that's such a great story. And it, that's a huge takeaway for me as well. And probably mm -hmm. for several of the people who are listening is that I think sometimes what makes us so uncomfortable in reaching out to mm -hmm. people who have just suffered a loss is like, I don't know what to say. Right. I don't know what to do, but we're already planning what to say and do. Right. 
ahead of time and realizing like, I don't think this is going to be enough or, you know, but really what, and what you're saying is, is just, just reach out just show up and you'll find out, you know? And, you know, I know when I've gone through loss, it didn't matter to me what people said and Mm -mm. did. It was just the fact that they were there. Yes, exactly. And, you know, what I find amazing is, was uh, even in those experiences where, you know, I, I have had that experience, um, not completely of not being able to find the bathroom in the home, but being kind of like feeling overwhelmed mm. and somewhat detached from everything going on around me. Cause I was in so much pain, mm-hmm. but I remembered who was there, mm-hmm. which was right. so interesting to me after the fact, like, I remember who showed up. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You, you know, and what they said, there isn't anything I mean, there's no magic sentence that you can say that makes it okay that somebody's loved one has died. There isn't any. And in fact, any of the ones that are often used are counterproductive at that Mm. moment. That um, It's really a bad moment to say, "Uh, God must have needed your child in heaven. Um, They can say that. Mom can say that. But I won't say that to her. Right. Right. No, absolutely. It's not the time to be coming up with justifications. No, exactly. I'm really just, just there. To, yeah. I'm just here. Be here when you need me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a great lesson. And Kate, what I want everyone to get is there's no one way to lead, right? We we're all we all have different personalities and strengths and experiences. So we're all going to lead differently. And, and that's actually a good thing. Mm. So how would you describe your leadership style? Well, it's funny, actually, I've learned a lot about leadership from the game wardens because um, there's it's a hierarchical organization. It's a, you know, it's law enforcement. So it's traditionally masculine um, in its not just in its demographic, but in sort of the way it's organized. So you have a colonel and you have a um, major, and you, you know, um, like in the military, you have a paramilitary command structure and. I've gotten to appreciate that very much, um, that there is, you know, that the responsibilities are laid out so clearly that's actually can be very helpful. I'm not in the command structure, so I don't have rank. There are chaplains who do, who are given the rank of whatever captain or something like that. And I felt, uh, because we, I, you know, was so much a part of creating the chaplaincy for the warden service that. I didn't want to have rank because my relationship to the colonel, the chief of the warden service, is exactly the same as my relationship to the brand new game warden, which is I'm his chaplain. And if we are at a scene um, where there's been a drowning and the family's there, my, you know, I am often in a leadership role in terms of what are we going to do with the family, you know, um, what does the family need? How are we going to respond to that need? Because that's kind of my area of expertise. If I'm driving in, you know, if I'm riding around in a truck with a game warden, and it can be the brand new baby game warden out of the academy, and um, he gets called to something and he says, stay in the truck, I stay in the truck because he has absolute authority over not just the truck, but the situation. And in order for him to be safe and for me to be safe and everybody else to be safe, I obey him. And so that's been an interesting thing because it's extremely important to know when to take on your authority and when to back off on it, when to let it go. And I've watched not just for me, but for any of the game wardens and the command staff that um, – one of, I'm very impressed by how when the lieutenants show up at a scene, they're really showing up to find out what the primary warden uh, needs from him. They're not actually showing up to take over command. They're showing up to say, is there something that I can do to make this easier for you? Because the primary warden is the primary investigator, so he's still going to be doing making decisions. and um, So that's been really interesting, sort of learning, really learning how, how you do leadership, how you yield the leadership position when you need to. It's like that metaphor about the geese, right? Isn't that thing about the geese? Yes. The lead goose, they take turns being the lead goose. And I yeah. wouldn't have thought you would see that in a hierarchical 
you know, paramilitary chain of command kind of thing. But I, that's where I learned it. Yeah, that's great. That's a, just a flexible style of leadership. And some of the best leaders I've ever had the pleasure of working with have been the ones who know, you know, when to take a step back, allow someone else to take the reins. And they, like you described, um, just a moment ago is they then take on the role of being of service. Right. How do I help? with this. How do yeah. I help? Yeah. It's an ama- and it's an amazing thing to watch because when teams can perform that way, and it yeah. sounds like you are on a team, um, they do with the main game. Yes. They do beautifully. Yes. It's really fun to watch. I mean, the situation is always awful, but it's very, I mean, it's beautiful to watch them. Mm. And Kate, what is one thing that you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Well, I just, I'm, I have a new book out, so I've been doing a lot of book uh, promotion stuff, but that's not a kind of a new project for me. <laughs> um, I finished writing that book a while ago. What I'm actually interested in now is uh, realizing it's really time to write a handbook for uh, sort of that describes the chaplain program at the warden service, how it came into being um, so that it can be replicated. So that's my next project is to, you know, put all of that material and all this experience together so that it doesn't get lost because I'm not there. And I don't have any plans to go anywhere, but you never know. And um, I want to make sure that I am replaceable and that the program is replicable. And there are other agencies in other states that are have been very interested in how the warden service has done this because it's really it's a very unusual program. Um, the chaplain of the warden service in Maine is for a long time was the only one in the country, which means the world. And, uh, we now, I think there are maybe four or five other states that have the same thing. And I want to make sure that we haven't, you know, um, that if Tennessee or Texas or whoever calls up and says, you know, how did you do this, that we can send them the book. Here it is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You have a passion for writing. That well, is I for do. sure. So I figure I might as yeah. well use it while I'm here. Yes. So. And although it isn't a new project, you are promoting your latest book. Yes. Do, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. It's called Anchor and Flares. And um, it is about my children are now, uh, the youngest is now 23 and the oldest is 28. So, and they are like stair steps between 23 and 28. And uh, the, I guess he's turned 29. Okay, never mind. He's the oldest is 29. Anyway, so I really got interested in watching, seeing what happens as each of the kids sort of came up to the threshold of adulthood and then crossed the threshold. And it became a very vivid, uh, sort of passage the first the the first time a kid in our family went through it because my son joined the marine corps at in 2004 when there were two wars going on and neither of them were going well so it was a a very challenging um transition much more so maybe than Kids, you know, a kid going off to college or something, having my son, Zach, join the Marine Corps uh, was hard. It was really hard and and really educational. And it really changed how my husband and I saw the subsequent kids, you know, who did some of them, you know, would go off to college or they'd take a gap year and go work or whatever. But sort of how we judged almost what they were doing and, and what direction they were you know, whether they were grown ups yet or not. And so the book is really about kind of that process, which I wasn't, I didn't expect this phase of parenting to be as complicated as it is. I really thought, you know, all my baby books kind of went up, kid books, child rearing books went up to the age of 18 and then you're kind of done. And it turns out you're not done um, because they're not done. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, so I found what I wrote my way to in writing this book was really a definition of when I consider that a child has become an adult. 
And that is, I wanted, actually wanted to call the book 10-8 because that's how I think of it. Uh, 10-8 is the uh, numerical code you use on the radio. So when I sign on, I'll say, this is 2107 at Gust, I'm 10-8. And it means I'm available for service. If something happens, you can call me. And I decided that's that's what a grown-up is, someone who's 10-8. Ah, uh, available for service. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I haven't had that experience myself, Kate. I don't have children, but I am very clear. I hear my parents' voice in my head because they are very clear that you will always be my child. Right. And they have eight, they have eight too. So they've got a a good number like you. And so even in retirement, they're very busy. (laughs) Yes. And worried. (laughs) I thought the worrying thing would stop, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Not from what not from what I see and not from what they tell me. So, (laughs) All right, Kate, now I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice that helps to make you a better leader? Well, I do an exercise with um, kids and actually I ended up doing it with adults, too, in sort of church school kind of events where I write a sentence on the board that says nothing matters more than blank. And then I invite the kids to fill in the blank and you get a whole range of things, right? Um, nothing matters more than my mom, nothing matters more than my new puppy, nothing that whatever. And after a while, the kids sort of start working towards, um, they realize this is a more significant question than that. They start working. Nothing matters more than nature, nothing. And at some point I say to them, you know, once you've finished that sentence, which can take a long time, like the rest of your life to really finish that sentence and deal with the implications of it. But once you finish that sentence, nothing matters more than blank. That is your functional definition of God. And mine is nothing matters more than love. And what that means for me is it's not nothing matters except love. It's nothing matters more than that. So it doesn't mean beauty doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Any of those things It's just that's once you put that in the top slot, everything else arranges itself. Yeah. So, and there are actually times when I will be in a situation with family or, you know, um, friends or whatever. And I really feel conflicted and torn and I will actually think, well, nothing matters more than love. So what, where's the love in this? And that, okay, that becomes the priority and everything else can drop under it. Um, and it works very well. Yeah. I imagine it helps to just put things like quickly into perspective. Exactly. In a very practical way. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) That makes sense. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? Oh, that's a good question. You mean other than mine? Obviously, yeah. <laughs> but I we'll definitely have yeah. yours okay. in the show notes. Yeah. Huh. Well, actually, what I, I mean, this is a strange, this may be sort of a strange answer, but um, at the moment, what I have been recommending is a book by Jonathan Haidt, H A I D T, called The Righteous Mind. And he's a science writer. Um, but he's writing about why people are, he's, I think the subtitle is why good people are divided by religion and politics. And it's a book about moral decision making, about how we make those decisions. And I found it really helpful, both in sort of, and slightly humbling in understanding how I have arrived at, you know, my views of various subjects but also in talking to other people with whom I probably disagree. And since one of the things that I've been very interested in for the last year or so has been trying to seek ways of bridging what feel like polarized um, and increasingly polarized opinions about a lot of things that actually kind of matter and we should Mm -hmm. kind of get on um, and that we have to have, be able to converse about them. So, uh, in order to fix it or to make things better. So for instance, out of, um, after reading this book, I, I did a little seminar for some law enforcement at the Academy on how to talk to a liberal. 
on the assumption most of them were conservative, right? I didn't ask them, I just assumed. And did how to have a constructive conversation with people with whom you deeply disagree. And I, to me, that is actually something that we really need to work on. All of us kind of need to work on that. I think that statement right there sold me on the book, like, perfectly, okay. like, how to have, you know, and what I'm hearing is, is how to have a productive, yes. satisfying conversation. Not how with to people. win an argument. That's a different. Right. How to have a, a productive, constructive conversation where you walk away feeling like you understand what the other person has said and they understand you a little better. Yeah. yeah. And this is probably the perfect time to read that book as well with the next election yeah. already like in full swing. Absolutely. You know, because some of these conversations are already going on and I've seen it tear relationships apart. Yeah, exactly. You know, which is sad. So, OK. All right, Kate, knowing what you know now, if given a chance to go back and do anything differently, what would you change? I'd like to have been kinder sooner. <laughs> um, I, the only things, you know, when I look back, I, there's not a lot of things I regret sort of in terms of like, I wish I had done this or gone there or whatever. But I do look back in, at moments when I was unkind and wish I had been kinder. Um, but in practical terms, and I tend to be very concrete, uh, I wish I had allowed my children to spend time with their father's body. Um, I spent time with their father's body, but they didn't get to. And that they got to see his body, but they didn't actually get to spend time with him. And I would have done that. Mm. Um, and we have, you know, had had some pretty amazing moments when young people and children have have had the opportunity to see and touch their parents' bodies or their, whoever, their siblings' body or whatever, and that that's been very positive. Now, Kate, share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. Well, I gave you my first one, which is nothing <laughs> yes. matters more than love. Um, yes. That's a good one. And the other one that I would say is you can't subtract pain but you can add love. So when we come to a situation in, uh, for instance, going to visit someone who's been recently bereaved, that, and that's a very common experience for all of us, that our instinct is, I need to say the right thing, I need to do the right thing, I need to bring the right casserole, I need to do something so that I can take away pain. And to really understand that Pain and grief are an extension of the relationship that, that, that the bereaved have had with the person they loved and have lost. So it, not only can you not take it away, you, you don't have the power to, you don't have the right to, but that really belongs to them and is an important part of their love of this, the person who's died. Um, but you can add in love. And thinking of it as really an additive rather than a, you know, an additive process you know, you show up, you add in love in whatever way, you know, you walk the dog, you babysit the kids, you bring food, you do any of the things that any of us do that you're really adding in, not taking anything out, taking away. Wow. That, I think that that's another thing, Kate, I really want to take from this conversation with you is, um, that you can't take away somebody's no. pain and it actually is not uh, a service to them right. to try. Cause I think that sometimes where we go wrong mm -hmm. is when we think, I just want to take away their pain. Right. I just want to make things easier for them. I don't want them to have to struggle. Right. And that's where we we can do a disservice to somebody. Yeah. You have to trust because them with their pain. That's right. hard to do. It is. Right. It's hard if you love them. It's hard with your kids. You have to trust them. Mm. And lastly, Kate, what is the best way for those listening to connect with you? You mean literally get in contact with me? Yeah, yeah oh, okay. if someone wanted to reach out, yeah. Um, my website, katebracedrip.com, has a, a feature where you can click contact and it'll send an email. You can send an email. Um, and that is the best way to reach me. It's the easiest thing to remember. Yeah. Yes. So. And I'll have it 
um, on the website. So for those listening, you can find this link and resources shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com, or you can use the short link, which is womentl.com. Kate, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. I know you mentioned you're in the back of a, a firehouse mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> set up while, while you're on tour, yeah. you know, talking about your book. So I thank you so much because I, I truly, truly believe we are all better for having met you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Were you inspired to take some action today, but maybe don't know where to start? Or maybe you have so many great ideas, you can't decide where to focus your attention. Don't let stress or overwhelm stop you from having the career, the business, or the life you want to live. Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching, or use the short link womentl.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.